Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Alex, and uh, Adam can't be here. He's got some family obligations that he's taking on. So um, it's good to have all you here. And, and, and I want you to uh, remember that we've got ways that you can share your, um, share your questions with us. I'm going to share my screen here. And uh, you can see on my screen, we've got um, questions are over here. Oh, there's me. There's me. And you can pull this part out and you can ask all your questions along the line here. If you're uh, watching over on YouTube and hope to get comments or anything over there, well, there you're not going to get any comments over there because nobody goes over there anymore. We're all on theastroimagingchannel.com. Uh, you can type in theastroimagingchannel.com and you can ca get called up there. And uh, that's what you'll see. And over here, you can uh, ask your questions. And George just offered us a picture and wants to get our opinion on it. So you can have your conversations over there. And you can, of course, um, yeah, Elias, I, um, I, when I started the uh, other program, I echoed for a minute, but I think we got rid of it pretty quick. Um, anyway, Steve Segarian is here today, and he's going to tell us a little bit about, let me get rid of this. Steve Segarian is going to be telling us about um, his solar project that he's developed over the last winter. And so I'm going to turn this over to Steve. And Steve, you should be there. Okay. Oh, down the rat hole there. Hmm. Are we start okay? Your, start, I... Yeah, start your PowerPoint. You should okay. Be okay. Let me know if you can see that. I'm still seeing you. How about now? I'm still seeing you. Okay, let me go back to uh, make sure that I'm sharing. You are presenting, it says. Okay, screen share. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, for some reason, let me see. Steve, we're, your screen seems to be repeating mine over and over again. Okay. So, if um, I do that, does that help? Um, yeah, now you're on a smaller screen doing the same thing. Hmm. All right. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute and go back. There is your PowerPoint. You got your PowerPoint showing. Okay. How about now? Is it good? Now, now we're seeing you and uh, uh, you personally. Hmm. Um, so now you need to start sharing your screen. All right. Do you guys see that? There, now you're on your PowerPoint. Ah, oh, okay, good. Okay, so you stay there you go. You're running your PowerPoint. Everything's cool. That's awesome. All right. All right. Uh, tonight's presentation is uh, about a solar-powered dark site that I sort of put together this last winter. Um, a little project that I did kind of just for fun. And so tonight's pr presentation is going to be in that same sort of spirit, just a little fun little dem uh, uh, presentation. Uh, one of the things on my bucket list is to uh, build and operate an amateur observatory of my own, uh, one that has fairly dark skies and allows me to do both visual imaging and, and of course, uh, astro imaging or visual and uh, imaging. I, I guess I, I think that's probably a dream that everybody has. And I think that that might be a topic of conversation for uh, some future presentation. Unfortunately, uh, I live in Chicago. Let's see if I can I pull up my. Oops, what happened here? Let's go back. Yeah. 
So this, this is a, a picture of my dark sky situation. I live uh, in the area west of Chicago um, and kind of in the red zone, basically. Uh, this is a map of the, the Midwest uh, around Illinois, uh, Indiana. Um, you can see on this um, dark sky map, you can see some, some dark areas over here to the, the lower left corner. That is mostly areas in uh, Iowa, so about four hours away. Um, if you try to go north to Wisconsin, you're pretty much uh, out of luck as well. There are some of these little lighter green bands uh, kind of surrounding Chicago, which uh, have fairly good skies. Um, so part of my... Um, bucket list adventure was to try and find a, a piece of land or property where I could build an observatory. And uh, some of the options, which I actually think would also make another good topic sometime, have somebody who's real estate savvy talk about building an observatory, how to purchase land or how to find land. Um, I, I went about it in my own way. And I'll talk a little bit about that, but uh, that's, that's not the focus of this thing. So anyways, uh, some of the options to build an observatory are to build it on your existing home site, which in my case, building it in the red zone doesn't sound like a really desirable thing. Um, buying a suitable vacant lot somewhere, you know, in one of those better areas. Uh, I, I tried to limit my search to um, something within two hours of driving, three hours of driving. Anything farther than that, and I, I felt like uh, it would just be too much of a hassle to try to get there on a weekend, and or in case something happened, uh, if I'm trying to do something remotely, uh, that would just be too much. So uh, my approach uh, was to look for homes in, or lots in a small town where the skies were good, where the viewing was good, and uh, where maybe I could get so good. Uh, I just, I'll just touch briefly on this. This is a, one of the examples of the places I looked small town in Illinois called Hoople, Illinois. And this is the entire town. It's actually about 600 people. Uh, there were some houses in this area that, no, no, I guess one of the questions would be, why would you want to buy a house rather than just a vacant lot? So the idea is that if you could find a house that's uh, fairly inexpensive in a good good site, then you could, uh, you know, you could do your imaging, go there and crash and then stay there, maybe drive back the next morning. So that was kind of prim my primary focus. Uh, if you look to the right there, you can see kind of an orange building off of, to the very right part of the, the uh, town. And it turns out that this property right here was available uh, for about 19K. It was a foreclosure. And um, the reason I like this particular property was that it's on this, let me go back, it's on the south side of the, of the city and so you have a really good view looking south and west and east you can see that there's basically nothing obstructing the, the site uh, but I didn't buy that one um, I started my search um, early last year and uh, went all over the state looking for um, you know, something that was in a darker greener area according to those maps and something that was uh, within two hours of driving. And as this slide says, I did finally find something. Uh, sky quality uh, measurement was about 20.96. So uh, better than anything I could find around Chicago, but uh, you know, not quite as good as uh, uh, say Nebraska or something like that. And then here's a, a quick picture of uh, the location, and you can, I don't know if you can see this little tiny red dot down here. It's actually in one of these dark green zones. And then here's a satellite image of the of the lot. The lot is right kind of in the middle of that, on that road there. Uh, this is what it looks like looking south from, from this property. Um, absolutely nothing to obstruct my view. Here's a picture of uh, it looking north, and you can see there's still uh, still nothing obstructing the view. 
uh, and this is looking west. So it's actually a fairly nice site. You also notice there's a, the power pole there. So there's, a, there's AC power that can be brought onto this. This is a, basically an unimproved lot. Um, and I really like it. I'm really happy with, with uh, the work in finding this. And uh, the plan is for uh, to start building uh, spring of this year, actually, and hopefully be operational in the fall. We'll see how that goes. I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that I can stay on schedule, but uh, things do happen. The one of the things I wanted to do is I wanted to start using it right away. I wanted to be able to go out there, set up my uh, telescope, and uh, do some imaging. So I wanted to have power there. Um, you know, I didn't want to lug my batteries and all that stuff uh you know that's always a hassle especially when you're talking about a battery that weighs 70 pounds or all that stuff so how could i get power out here and and leave it there and then uh and use it when i wanted just to drive out so uh the situation is that ac power was available but not actually on the site i'd have to bring it in i have to have the local electric company either bring it in and hook it to a, a meter or they could bury it and hook it to a meter so that that's the you see that the cost um seventeen hundred dollars was for just bringing it from the pole to a meter uh 2500 was for actually burying the line and bringing it to a meter so as it turned out i was lucky that i had inherited some some solar panels from uh, a project i had uh, three of these 150 watt solar panels which I could use to charge a 100 watt, 100 uh, amp hour battery uh, that would power my rig and allow me to use it on site. So the plan was to use it on weekends and occasionally in the weekdays whenever there was something really special there. If, the, if uh, it really was um, like a new moon in the middle of the week, I could drive out, spend a couple hours there, I wouldn't have to lug my batteries and all the stuff out there. So that that's that was the kind of the goal of. Um, this project. And here's a little block diagram of what I was doing. So I've got the uh, solar panels, these, these three panels hooked up uh, in uh, series. And then this box here is the controller, um, the charging controller. And then of course, you notice there's a, uh, in order to do this and do it, you know, in the, in the weather that we have, Oh, here's my pointer. Okay, can you guys see that? I hope so. Yeah, we're fine. That. Great. Um, the batteries can't be left, they just can't be left out in the open and they can't be even just in an enclosure. They have to be kept at a certain temperature or temperatures that allow it to charge and to, to be used. And so part of the project was to build this sort of an insulated housing. And, I, and I, I, I've shown this as a little box here. So inside this box, I have... Uh, a 100 amp hour deep cycle marine battery. And I created a little battery controller, uh, the temperature controller. This could be a, an Arduino or uh, any of the other um, DIY um, microprocessor boards with a little uh, temp sensor and then a, a heater element. Now, couple of months, or actually a couple of years ago, I gave a presentation on how to make uh, dew heaters. And so I used that same idea of a uh, just some nichrome wire uh, encased in uh, uh, a padded um, enclosure to, to work as a dew heater. So the idea was that this temp controller would monitor the temperature inside the box, this, uh, I should say, insulated box. And whenever the temperature got below uh, threshold, say 35 degrees, it would kick on for uh, about a half an hour and it would just heat the space through the heater and then, of course, continue to monitor the temperature. And that's the idea is that with this insulating uh, box with the heater, I could keep the batteries even in the middle of winter at a, a fairly close temperature to, to, 30, to 30 degrees. Um, let's see. I think that's, I just said this, so let me, uh, here's my battery, uh, uh, Renology uh, 100 amp hour deep cycle marine battery. And I, I think the the most important thing to take away from this picture is that the, it can only be charged between zero and 40 
C. So uh, this is roughly 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, however, it can be just, you know, if I was going to use it or charge, or charge it, I could, it could uh, stay at this temperature. But the idea is that during the day, uh, I would like the temperature to be in the inside that box to be roughly, uh, you know, within this, well, it has to be within this range, I guess. So, um, yeah, so let's move on. Here's the uh, solar charger that I used. Uh, fairly typical. You can buy these on eBay, um, about 150 bucks, I think, 200, uh, somewhere in that range, depending on which amperage you get. So there's this table shows that you can buy, uh, I guess, four different models, and I chose to get the the 40 amp charger system. Uh, now the thing that's interesting about this is that its working temperature is uh, minus 25 to, to plus 45 degrees C. So it's got a much wider range than the battery itself. And so it didn't really have, actually have to be inside the uh, insulated enclosure. It could be outside. In fact, I'll, you'll see that uh, in the slides that I'll show you next. Um, here's the solar cells. Um, this is just a picture of this, uh, the label on the back. That These are actually just uh, some stuff I grabbed off the internet. Um, I'm not sure if there's this has a temperature specification on it in terms of whether it can operate, um, but uh, I don't see it. In any case, I had three of these. Um, it turns out I uh, I worked with a company that was um, trying to get into the solar cell business or solar installation business. And uh, they did not, they weren't successful. So at um, some point they decided to, to just distribute what remaining materials they had left over to their employees and call it a day. So I ended up inheriting three of these, uh, not these, but similar to these, obviously the 155 watt ones. And they've been sitting in my garage for a couple of years now. I thought this would be a perfect uh, use of them. So, Okay, so I have this concept, you know, this is, uh, I wanted to see if this is actually going to work. So I built a, um, an insulating box using, uh, this is R T R10 material. These, uh, this is the kind of insulating material you can buy. It's a rigid foam from, from Home Depot. Uh, each section of this is R10. So there's three sections that, so that gives me roughly an R30 insulating, uh, a value when I when when all is said and done here, and this enclosure here you can see was where the battery would go, and so I put this together and I wired it up with the controller, and you can see over here the, the wires coming out of the box, and uh, it's getting ready to go outside. This is uh, I think mid January when I started this part of the project, so the idea was to put outside, um, monitor the out outside temperature, and then monitor the temperature in the box to make sure that. Uh, you know, when the temperature was uh, minus 10 outside, uh, the uh, the temperature inside the box was uh, roughly 32 degrees or better. Um, it worked out real well. I was really happy with the results. I had it out there for about two weeks uh, in the middle of uh, January. The thing I didn't tell you about the controller is that I had a Bluetooth module built onto it so that I could actually pull the data off of the, the controller and see, you know, kind of... Um, monitor the temperature that way it's happening. Um, so then well, once I validated this actually would work, I decided to build um, kind of a nice enclosure for the battery. Uh, right there, this is uh, using our latest uh, design tool, SketchUp, as a, as a free um, available 2D 3D CAD package, and so I just used it to kind of dimension the the size in, of the box and the, the parts. Uh, the box itself here is made out of uh, three quarter inch um, plywood. I think uh, um, I picked a better quality than normal, but I'm not. I can't recall what the actual quality of the plywood was. I didn't want uh, just uh, fiberboard or something. But you can see here the idea is. The battery is sort of in the center of this enclosure, and they, uh, at some point I'll fill this, these spaces in with actual foam. Uh, the battery sits in the center, and it's insulated. Um, okay. 
here are a few more pictures. Um, again, another picture of the kind of kind of getting ready to be filled in. Here is a picture of the uh, most of the foam inside of it. It's all ready to go. Um, now the upper part of this enclosure is where the controller will go, and there's a lid here that you can actually open up to see what's you know what what's going on with the charger, and as well as the cable from the battery to my mount is stored there. And then whenever I wanted, I would just open up this this uh, door here, pull out the cable, and then string it along to the mount, and then I could use the uh, the battery. Here's a picture of the battery getting ready to go in the final uh, installation. And you can see I've, uh, when I gave that class on how to make dew heaters, I showed everyone how to take some nichrome wire and uh, thread it through some uh, heat shrink tubing and then um, basically uh, adhere it to a sticky uh, back uh, paper. Um, now this particular Heater was designed to generate about 20 watts of of power, so essentially like a small 10 watt, 15 watt light bulb. Uh, and I've, at this point, you can see on this picture, I've actually adhered it to the side of the battery. Here is a picture on the right side that of the, the 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 battery box completed and ready to go. Uh, I've painted it up. Um, well, actually, it's not complete. I've got at the top here, I haven't got the plexiglass uh, sealed over this window. Uh, but it, on this side, you can see the controller. It's installed. You can see the battery uh, connections going down. Um, the connections to the solar cells also go through this, this small port here. And then th these wires here go to the connector that would go to my mount. So there's a coil of wire. I'll show, they, show you that in a minute that goes out to the mount. Um, okay. Here's a picture of the solar mount itself, the solar cell mount. I, I only have one picture of it, this frame here. Uh, and I have, I don't know why I, I didn't take more pictures of it, but uh, basically the solar cells lay in this mount. The angle of this is roughly the same latitude as uh, about 41 and a half degrees, which is the latitude for Chicago. Um, and here's a kind of a little detail of how I've mounted. Uh, I took some of these um, like quarter inch uh, angle brackets and I uh, bolted them to the wood. So this this wood has been painted several times to try to keep it uh, water resistant. Uh, and then I've, I'm mounting the solar cells in there. And then here is, obviously on the right, this is the completed system. Um, you can see the solar cells, the, the mounting points where it's bolted down. On the, the left here is another detail of uh, how it's mounted in the center over here and here. And if you look carefully, you can see that there's the cable coming out from the uh, the battery box and a bunch of cable laying on the ground. That would go to my telescope. So uh, this also actually is my backyard. I, I, the idea was I wanted to sort of prove this out over the next couple of months here in, in my, you know, locally where I could monitor the the charging make sure everything was functional and then actually test it uh, on a weekend when i could actually go outside hook up my mount make sure that i had uh you know i could run the batteries uh full time and that the the power that was being used to heat the batteries wasn't draining the batteries such that i couldn't use it you know when i wanted to use it And uh, here's a couple more pictures. This is uh, shows again. You can see the cable coming off, and here's my my little uh, pad for my uh, my telescope mount. The three cells, the battery box. Um, yeah, that's okay. And then uh, this is just a picture again of the um, just <laughs> actually this is the day I hooked it up. You can see there's no no power being delivered. Here's the coil of wire kind of just nestled inside the box. Um, and then <laughs> the very next day after I put this outside, this happened. So we got our first uh, little bit of snow. Um, and then and, uh, later on, we got a lot of snow. And um, so this thing went through a fairly good uh, cycle of winter. 
for the Midwest. It proved it to self to work pretty good. Obviously, I wouldn't be out in the snow trying to do imaging in this kind of weather, but the fact is that, you know, after the snow, the you, you have to, you know, be sure that the cells of the snow is um, melted enough that you can get power to it and that uh, nothing gets inside the enclosure itself so that uh, you don't want any water getting down into the bottom of this thing. Uh, I tried to seal it up real well to make sure it was uh, uh, watertight and, uh, and uh, obviously I want to keep that as, as dry as possible. The current situation is that uh, everything is working fine and it keeps the battery at a uh, uh, 32 degrees and uh, about 13.8 uh, volts. Uh, it's been available anytime I wanted to use it. Um, this last month, of course, we've, we've we've moved from snow to rain, so I'm also sort of validating that the, the seals are keeping the rain out. And it's, uh, in my opinion, it's ready to go. I think uh, uh, as soon as I get uh, a free weekend here, I'm going to move it out to my... Uh, my observatory site and uh, I'll use it until I get the my observe my actual observatory built and powered uh, uh, whatever however that may be I actually may use this to power the observatory um, you know in the future I might actually modify the system to include several new s several additional batteries and probably a few more cell cells if I want to just go go green and go off the grid and if I decide to um, you know, bring power to the the site, and uh, this will just, I, I'm not sure what this will do. Uh, maybe I'll just uh, decommission it and use it for something else. Anyways, that's all. Um, short presentation for tonight, but hopefully uh, uh, you enjoyed my little uh, uh, project and uh, got a chuckle out of it. So, Alex, I'll just uh, stop sharing here. I have a quick question. Yes. Uh, have you considered lithium ion batteries? Um, did you look into it? Uh, even, did you weigh the options, what the pluses, pros and cons and um, price and, you know, any factors? Did, did you have that in, did you ever look into it? That's all, I'm, that's my question. I, I did not, and the reason I did not is because I already had that battery, and I was using that that battery for, um, you know, for, for my regular adventures out. To, um, but I actually have been looking into that. I've been thinking about that lately. Um, I priced some some lithium ion batteries. Uh, for one thing, the the <laughs> uh, the battery I showed you weighs about sixty six pounds. Um, if I went to lithium ion, it would be closer to twenty one pounds. So. Um, that in itself, I mean, in, if you're going to haul them around, it's certainly an advantage. The price is, I think, substantially higher, but um, I, I guess I couldn't quantify it entirely. Yeah, well, the, the advantage is that, you know, um, lead acid batteries, um, you know, the recommend you can only discharge them to about 50%, and they, you know, they want you to charge it back up after 50%. You know, you can't, just because you have a 100 amp hour battery, you don't get to use 100 amp hours. Uh, but on lithium, lithium ion, you get to use about down to about 20%. So that, that's, you, you, you need less battery. Not only the batteries are smaller, but you need less of them to get the same amount of power. That's the... Are, are you using any... Uh... Lithium batteries for dark sites now? Are you uh, zero? I'm wondering if there's anything that's out there that's has the. I know that they do make uh, motorcycle batteries for uh, lithium um, cells. I'm not sure about uh, higher capacity. No, I'm. I'm not using anything. I was just curious that if you had considered it. That's and. Uh... Well, I work for a group that is actually using lithium batteries, so I've I've t talked to a few people there, and I've I'm I, if I decide to um, you know go green entirely and, and use batteries for this for the observatory completely, uh, I would definitely look into that, um, especially um, 
if if the prices are dropping. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure wh where they're at with that now. I think this battery cost me roughly $190 when I bought it, and that was probably two years ago. Um, we've got a couple of comments coming in about um, batteries in general. Um, and uh, as uh, uh, Martin has pointed out, the lithium is so light, they are much more expensive, as everybody knows. And, you know, if, from an engineering standpoint, the object of engineering is not just to build stuff, but it's to build stuff most efficiently, according to what you really need out of a system. And what you really need out of a system is not lightweight in this particular system. And so um, you might be just as well off with, uh, for instance, if you had a battery that could perform at a much lower temperature, then you might not need to suck battery power in order to keep the temperature up. And that might be an engineering win in the long run. Um, I know that a lot of people, for instance, who aren't worried about size so much, instead of putting in one 12 volt battery in their RVs, put instead two six volt, six volt batteries in there. They put two of them in there and um, link them up in series and they get much, much more capacity um, it does cost them weight and and space, but uh, many RVs are equipped to handle just that. And uh, so if you're building a system, you might want to consider doing something like that instead. I think one of the um, criteria for me was uh, to keep my wife happy, and that's not the, that meant <laughs> not you, buying any more stuff than necessary. Just, yeah, that's that's the most efficient use of resources is to use something you've already got. Earlier, there was a question from Elias, I think, that um, his battery consisted of a battery from um, Harbor Freight or Celestron. A whole lot of people make uh, battery starter packs where you get, uh, sometimes you get a flashlight and a, an AM FM radio and a boom box and all sorts of stuff all put together and um, in one place. Let me see if I can share some screen here without entirely screwing this up. I'm gonna share my entire screen here. And um, next I'm gonna go, where do I wanna go? I wanna go over here, I think. And make that full screen and go to um, sealed lead, lead acid battery. See these things here? This is what's at the bottom of your starter. When you buy, when you go down to um, uh, Harbor Freight or Celestron or something, and um, this is what you're buying. That's your power right there. This one, for instance, is um, a Lucas Seal Lessed Lead Acid Battery 1012. It's 12 volts, 10 amp hours. Um, and that's not a whole lot of amp hours, but it's incredibly small. And that is probably the heart of the system that you're talking about. Uh, 10 amp hours. I don't know what the 20 hour means, but these things cost, you can get a couple of them for uh, 35 bucks. They cost 15 to 30 bucks, depending on what you're getting. So if you've got one of those starter kits, um, you know, you can, uh, it has lots of different uh, contacts on it. Um, a couple of 12 volt outlets. This is the battery that's running it. And that's all the more you're getting, something like that. That's the actual part. The, you probably don't need the AM, FM radio when you're out there and a few other things. So don't go too, no, don't go too crazy on that. Okay, that was my contribution. Who's that, anybody else in the room have some other questions? Well, I didn't mean to say you should use lithium ion batteries. My, my comment was more like, uh, does it make sense? That's exactly what my question was. Like, uh, I was asking Steve if he put the pros and cons, and because there are many factors. First of all, lead acid batteries take about a thousand cycles, and then they're done. Uh, lithium ion batteries about three thousand cycles, so they might have a lot longer lifespan. Uh, and then you need half the battery, uh, because let's say if you need twenty amp hours. Uh, a night, you can't use a 20 amp hour lead acid battery. You need to use a 40 amp hour battery so you can only use 50% of it and you don't want to 
discharge it below 50 percent with lithium ion batteries you can get away with um you know 30 amp hour altogether so yes per amp per lithium ion may be more expensive but if you put the whole system together it might be actually be cheaper that was my question i didn't mean to say this one is better than the other no i i got your i, I understood your question i i uh, to be honest with you, I didn't even consider it just because of, uh, you know, one of my design criteria is obviously not to tell my wife that I'm going to spend, uh, you know, $900 on batteries for something. So I had I had this battery available, and uh, it was just an obvious choice. To, this project wasn't meant to be something I was going to try to get an award on. It was yeah, just you're not going to combine it. So how, how long do you expect to use it? I just, I hope to use it just this year. Um, I, I'm hoping that uh, by the fall of this year, I'll have my regular, I'm going to build a roll off roof uh, observatory and I'm hoping to have that done uh, and operational, you know, just in time for the, the winter season. Do, uh, batter, do batteries generate heat while they're being charged or discharged? They do actually, yes, yeah would in the process of discharging the battery would it generate as much heat as you're using to heat it i i don't think so um yeah I, and the other issue is that uh, at night when the, there's no charging going on i, I wanted uh, to make sure that the batteries didn't get too cold so the, that's why the controller's in there to, okay. to monitor temperature and turn on that all that insulation is also going to keep it from warming up during the day that's true. You're right. Yeah, uh, right. I guess my hope was that uh, it wouldn't get above 40 degrees C. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. I'm reading through the questions here. You know that when you showed us the picture of the uh, platform of the solar panels, they, it was down on the ground and, you know, I am a Southern California boy. I don't know what I'm talking about here. I'm sure I will be laughed at, but I'm used to that. Um, the okay, if you put that up four feet and uh, you know put it up higher four feet, uh, would the snow have a better chance to shed off? I know it wouldn't probably stop how much lands there in the first place, but it mm, if you got a heavy snowfall, the panels might clear and slide off. That's absolutely true too. Yeah, I think uh, when I actually put this on site, I may uh, build up a small platform of uh, bricks or some uh, pavers or something to get it up off the ground, foot okay. maybe two feet. Uh, the other the other concern I'm worried about is uh, in the in the Midwest we get very strong with the, uh, spring mm -hmm. storms and stuff. So I'm worried that that might be an issue. I might actually have to somehow bolt it to the ground. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that that's going to have to happen anyway, because as Linda says, you have to worry about the physical security of things. Yeah, that's the other issue. Um, this property is out in the middle of nowhere. There's a couple of farm families that live there, uh, but still, um, you know, it wouldn't surprise me to show up one day and find <laughs> and find either the solar panels missing or the box missing or both. So. Hmm. Okay. Um, when you say there, there's no neighbors or anything around? Well, there there are, um, um, there's a farm family roughly about a quarter of a mile to the east of me, and then there's a farm family a quarter of a mile to the west of me. And that's basically it. Okay. Terry's um, suggesting that if you if you go with this, in the long run, you know, we've already discussed the issue of should we, you know, are we, are we going to build something new or just go with what you already had in your backyard, you know, in, in, your, in your shed? You should look at going to 48 volts because it's cheaper in the long run. There's less copper required. Do, are you familiar with that? I don't know much. Terry, you're not in the room, right? No. So. Take lift batteries, uh, lift batteries, lift batteries. I'm reading through the comments. Uh, yeah. Oh. Elias has a suggestion. How feasible would it be to bury your batteries five or ten feet deep? <laughs> um, well, I, I guess I own the property. If I want to dig a hole and put them in there, I could do that. I, I, 
I guess the, the only other issue there is maintenance, right? You're trying to get to them if they if you want to replace them or if uh, uh, they stop uh, charging. Yeah. I, the, the other issue is I think once I get my my observatory built, I'll probably move the batteries inside the uh, the enclosure. There's a I, I plan to have a small area that's insulated, so the the need to keep them, uh, you know, in a box like that would be less necessary. Okay. Um, let's see. We've swapped some comments back and forth. Uh, still talking about lithium batteries. Why am I presenting? Oh, because I clicked the wrong, because I clicked the, there we go. See, because Adam's not here. Adam's supposed to be in charge. Now we are now we oh. should be seeing Steve again. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Olga. Hope you didn't do anything embarrassing while you were on the screen. <laughs> okay. I think we've gone through all the questions about Steve. Steve, thank you for the presentation. Um, I want to also encourage anybody else who's been building something um, and they would like to share it. Look, if you don't have 45 minutes of stuff to share, that's perfectly all right. We can put you together with maybe somebody else has got 15 minutes of something to share. Maybe we should have everybody sign up to do 10 minutes of some neat gas uh, astronomical imaging um, uh, thing that they've done. And we can get you in here and do that. Uh, down towards the end, uh, Terry asks, um, how do you get in the room? Okay, Terry and everybody else. We can fit about eight people into the room. And the people that get invited to the room are people that have presented before or are presenting now. Uh, and for some reason or another, we really need to get them into the room. Let me see. i got to make me active now. Um, and you should be seeing me now, I guess. Oh, you weren't seeing me. Um, yeah, we're going to. Yeah, you're seeing me? Okay. Um, yes. So we get we get about, um, we can only fit about eight people in. And we send out a list of people, and, and so the regulars get can get in the room. We'd need to know if there's a special reason we need to get you in the room, um, and we've got room. We can invite you, but we have to send you a link to be able to get into the room. Um, and we can't do that with everybody because uh, we just don't have the bandwidth in the, uh, the way the, the – um, YouTube chats are built up. So that's that's the answer to your question. And there's it's really awkward to do it right in the middle of a show. Um, if we know we're going to do it before a show, great, we can do that. Okay. Um, uh, let's go all the way back up to George's picture. You see George's picture came in at 1830 uh, in my time. I don't know what time zone you guys are in. Took some AP this weekend. When I stacked and did a stretch of the data, I got this. And you can click on that. And you can see that uh, his pinwheel has got some rather strange patterns around on the side. If anybody would like to make some comments on that, you're sure welcome to do it. Chow's asked if anybody's going to NEEP, so you're welcome to put something in about that. I'm not going this year because... A, it's far from California. I do like going back there. I go back there. I try to go back there every couple of years um, and, uh, you know, just to kind of catch up on some stuff. But as you probably have heard, I'm not as much of a, of a Googling, I'm not as much into um, uh, uh, technology as most of the people in this group. Um, let's see. I'll, I'll be over there. Tolga will be going there. Was that a Tolga? Okay. Yeah, I'm not getting the booth because I'm too much of an astronomy fan. I want to walk around and see stuff. Okay. Okay. Um, whose face have we got? We got? We're still looking at Steve. How come? I think I told this to go to. No, we're looking at you. Whoops. Now we lost your audio. You muted yourself. Oh, well, that's probably probably popular. Thing. No, we're looking at you. Okay, you're looking at me. Okay. Um, I got the paint off of me. I spent yesterday painting out at our Dark Sky site. Uh, Steve, a couple of comments here that you've done a good job on the on the show. Glad we're doing it. Um, we're always looking for presenters. And, um, and so keep them coming. Uh, somebody asked a question last week in the comments if we could explain 
um, uh, plate solving. And I would, you know, I can do something like that. I can tell you what I know about plate solving. My problem with, I only know what I know. I don't know what I don't know. I, I for instance, I don't think I've ever used Astro Tortilla. Uh, and I know a lot of people do that. Um, if we can get a few of the people, a few of the regulars like Tolga and, and uh, Adam and, and uh, who have used these other systems for doing it, I could give you a theoretical background for what plate solving is. <laughs> like, I don't really know what it is, but I could tell you what I've heard about it and read about it, um, regurgitate it like I was reading your Wikipedia page. Um, but, um, and then I could show you how I do it in Sequence Generator Pro using either um, uh, Pinpoint or Plate Solve 2, which is what I use now. And I can tell you a bit, little bit about how it's uh, done in Pix Insight. But I need somebody else along the way to volunteer to, you know, that they've used the more common like Astro Tortilla and stuff like that. So please send your comments to Adam. Uh, Adam should be back next week. He had family things to do this week again. Uh, so he, uh, he wasn't able to be with us. And of course, with Adam back next week, all the technical things about who's presenting and echoes and stuff like that should go away a little bit more. If there are no further questions, I don't see any of them developing out there. Let's see. Oh, the, how are you guys going to locate each other at um, NEEF? I would suggest that um, if you could all make hats out of aluminum foil. <laughs> Linda says, I'll be a woman. I, hey, that's sad, Linda. You should get some of your compatriots to join us. By sad, I mean... I was looking at the imaging, um, the statistics from um, who watches these shows. And here's, here's one freaky thing. Uh, it's like the percentage of, of females watching these shows registers as zero. And I know it's not zero because Linda's here and occasionally we would get others. Um, and, um, but we we have to do something to diversify this hobby, really. Um, there, it, it seems another weird thing that came up was I looked at three shows that I did, um, you know, over the years. And of the three shows, all together, it was like 114 or 119 or something like that days out there in the world, somebody or many somebodies have spent 119 days watching my presentations alone. We've got some presentations that have had 100,000 visitors and it's really freaky what, what's going on out there. By, by tonight, I'm, I think that last week's show will probably have seen, been seen by 600 people. Now, not necessarily full time, they don't watch the whole thing, but that 600 people, maybe 100 people each watching 15 minutes here, 14 minutes there, 20 minutes there, plus a couple of robots coming in to check them out, stuff like that. But it's really interesting to read the statistics on all that. Okay. Um, I think that does it for tonight, folks. We're going to sign off here. Think if we can figure out how to sign off. Adam's not here to show us. So thanks for being here, and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, goodbye, everybody.